the Excelcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kuskiski, and today I'm speaking with two special guests, Laura Pettibone and Catherine Theron. Thank you so much for coming to talk with us today. Pleasure. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Great. So uh, to give you an introduction, so uh, Laura um, and Catherine are both dancers. They have a history with the Eric Hawkins Dance Company, but they do a lot of other things as well. Their careers have really flourished, and they wear multiple hats. So uh, Laura, could you start? Give us a quick like, one-minute version of all the things that you do in your career. Right, so um, as I, I danced with Eric Hawkins for 12 years, and now I uh, teach at various levels, performing arts high schools, universities, master classes, and I'm a repetiteur of Eric Hawkins dance works. I do historical research, and I do presentations on Eric's works and life. Great, thank you. And Catherine, how about you? I, too, dance with Eric Hawkins. Mm -hmm. I dance for seven years. Um, with Laura, we present um, information on Eric Hawkins, and I also taught for 20 years. I now am a curator at the 92nd Street Y in New York City. My job there is to um, develop series of choreographic platforms for choreographers, legacy work, mm. um, new work, um, Oh, anything that I can think of that will be of interest to the wider dance community. I also am a member of the Bessie's Committee, the New York Dance and Performance Awards, mm -hmm. and in that capacity and in my the capacity of um, my job, I see between three and five uh, performances a week all over wow. New York City and New Jersey. And I think Laura was going to say a little bit about Eric. Yeah, it would be great to hear, just for our audience who may not be familiar, a little bit more about who Eric Hawkins was and the story of his company. So Eric Hawkins started dancing after he graduated from Harvard. And he um, studied in Europe with a German dancer named Harold Kreutzberg. And then he was the first student at the School of American Ballet when George Balanchine opened up that school. And he danced in some, a lot of uh, George Balanchine's early works, including Serenade, and taught at the Bennington School, which was a very important summer dance um, conference. Then he met Martha Graham, and uh, they fell in love, and he danced with Martha for 10 years and did a lot to contribute to her choreography and um, touring as well as being married to him. So then in the 50s, they uh, split up, and he started his own company with a very different um, aesthetic. So where Martha was very dramatic, Eric wanted um, a more poetic and metaphorical kind of mm -hmm. dance. And he was very dedicated to contemporary music. He commissioned all of the scores for a chamber orchestra that we toured with, so we never performed to a tape. He thought that that was death to, you know, not have the live um, feeling of the music. Um, and he commissioned um, masks and costumes and set pieces from contemporary um, artists as well. Fantastic. So, so let's take a step back. So we could spend this whole time just unpacking all the things that you do now. You have very kind of I would say a diverse portfolio of activities, both of you, and they both uh, both of your stories kind of go back in a way to working with his company, um, and not to oversimplify it. But let's go there for a moment. Can you talk a little bit? Because that that's an amazing platform to have the opportunity to work with someone like him and, and his company. It's the dream of many of uh, many dancers, many people that are going to school to study dance. So can you talk a little bit about how, maybe just a little a little summary of that experience of working with him? Um, and his company, uh, your respective stories, and also how that set the stage for what came next, or or in a or maybe in ways it didn't. <laughs> Catherine, um, I well, I was just reflecting on mm -hmm. what you were saying about dancing, and as I mentioned earlier in mm -hmm. our conversation, yep. I was an art history major, mm -hmm. but I was interested in dance and. I started dancing as a result of seeing a photograph of Jose Limon's company and went to Ravinia mm -hmm. and saw the, the company and then decided I wanted to dance. Um, when I graduated, I, you know, it, I made the decision to move to New York. It was a difficult decision, but um, 
I then went to Teachers College at Columbia University because I felt like I needed a profession mm -hmm. um, in addition to dancing where I could earn a living. So that was to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. I danced with a number of, number of um, dance companies, including Big Dance, um, Big Dance, Anna B. Parsons Group. And then I, I decided that I should be trained more thoroughly, not just in ballet. Um, and I was a gymnast earlier, so I, I, I felt like I needed, I wanted something. I craved a more, um, a deeper approach to movement. And I found Eric's company, and Laura was my teacher. <laughs> um, and actually, Jessica Fogel, who's the head of the dance department, she and I went to Columbia together, I see. and we took class with Laura and the other <laughs> <clears throat> members of the company. So that was my entrance into into the Hawkins world. I didn't think I would. I wasn't necessarily interested in becoming a mm -hmm. Hawkins dancer, but. I became more and more interested, fascinated actually, mm -hmm. by his aesthetic and his approach to movement, which was both uh, delicate and and fleeting, fleet, and trained the entire body, the mind. He was a fascinating individual, um, highly educated and fluent in in the ways of of movement, philosophy, music, um, and he as Laura said, uh, worked with so many amazing, uh, marvelous artists. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a world in which one could enter and a world that I, I wanted to stay in. Mm -hmm. So I stuck around for a long time. Um, no one was leaving. Mm -hmm. Once you entered that company, you didn't leave. So I was added. Uh, mm -hmm. Typically there were, uh, I mean, when I first went to the company there were eight dancers four women four men mm -hmm. and then I was added um, eventually so my my experience with Eric was at, toward the end of his life mm -hmm. and even then he was a vibrant individual and I I feel thankful to have um, worked with him when he developed two dances and then I learned a number of dances mm -hmm. as well so amazing yeah. Okay, so but so much to unpack there. One of the most interesting things is to the the beginning of the story. You started as an art history major, yes. uh, maybe not typical. So, like, can you talk a little bit about the same journey? And were yeah. you studying other things beyond dance? What's your? How did you get connected to the company? Right. So, um, I started as a kid. We all, all my sisters and I, we took dance, we took music, um, and when I went to college I was a music major. I studied um, harpsichord, flute, and composition, and it was when um, I did an internship with a composer out in San Diego, and um, he, you know, in addition to editing tapes and manuscripts and things like that, he had me writing music for the MFA mm -hmm. dance students. Mm -hmm. And so while I was there, I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll just take some classes. And the woman who was teaching taught Hawkins technique. So when I started moving in that way, it was like coming home. It was just such a wonderful way to move. And so then I, I did go to New York right after that and studied at the studio. And the, the holistic way that Eric um, trained us was, you know, you had to know about music. He would say things to read. I would stop at this used bookstore on the way home from class to buy whatever book he had been talking about in that in that class. And it, being around the composers and musicians and artists was really spoke to me mm -hmm. a lot. Um, so I did go back and finish college, but uh, then I moved back to New York and um, I was just lucky that somebody left the company around that time, and I was very young, but mm -hmm. I think Eric saw something that he could mold, and so I did get into the company and was just thrown into stuff because somebody mm -hmm. had been injured, and so, you know, I'm learning these roles on the road in hotel rooms, oh, wow. and <laughs> and it's wow. one of those examples, you know, you got to be ready to step up. Mm -hmm. um, you never know when that's going to happen, so that worked worked well for me. Wow, so it's, uh, in, it's really interesting to hear how you describe the experience. You sort of mentioned whole, the word holistic, 
it seems to me that just from hearing this, your both of your brief stories about it, that that was an environment that really required a holistic mindset and a variety of skills um, and interests amongst the performers, um, in addition to the, the core performative skills that one must have. And I, I want to talk a little bit in a moment about how that experience and those skills and the mindset has translated into your activities, professional activities since that time. But before we do that, I want to spend just a moment to ask you about what it means to be a steward of Eric Hopkins' legacy. And in fact, you know, some of the work you're doing here with our students is sort of continuing the, um, to spread, you know, his work and his technique with our students to keep it alive, um, which is very important. It's also, I can imagine, a challenge because it's also coming through your own, um, you know, your own interpretation and your sort of, um, your, your growing maturity as an artist over time. So what does it mean for both of you to be stewards of that legacy? And how do you um, approach that work with students when you go to do these workshops? Well, um, the first thing that comes to mind is, is it is a living, breathing mm -hmm. thing. So what is Eric Hawkins' technique? Well, it's been on a continuum of growth and change even while Eric was alive. Mm -hmm. So there is no one Eric Hawkins technique. Mm -hmm. There's some philosophies and aesthetic viewpoints, but um, he didn't even like the word Eric Hawkins technique. <laughs> you know, he, he wanted to be an artist. He wanted us to be artists in the broadest sense of, of that word. So when I think about, um, you know, bringing that legacy forward, I, I try to avoid the preciousness of trying to keep it perfect how it was because mm -hmm. there is no such thing. Mm -hmm. Eric changed the roles as dancers changed, as he had new new artists come in to, to dance for him. If they couldn't do something the same way somebody else did, he would adapt. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that gets lost when you try and make something exactly the way it was mm -hmm. because that's not true. So as a legacy, I try and also keep that holistic point of view when I teach. And, and that's a very hard Thing, in fact, because dance is so often taught as such a physical thing that it's about strength and flexibility and um, virtuosity. articulation, virtu virtuosity. And, you know, Eric spent a lot of each class talking about other things, mm -hmm. about current events, about somebody he saw walking on the street, about a book he just read. And that created us as whole artists. Mm -hmm. And and that's very hard to um maintain. I even went back a couple years ago, I took a bunch of um, audio tapes I had made of master classes, and I wrote myself a script of how Eric taught a class, because I've of course added my own interests, my own somatic studies, my own you know natural movement vocabulary, and so I wanted to go back and say what were the words Eric actually used, and, and that was fascinating because you know I studied with him for a decade, and um, there was a lot I'd forgotten. <laughs> so that's one one way of looking at it. Wow. So for, how, how is it for you, uh, Catherine? I imagine there's some similarities, but... Well, um, Eric was very clear about the principles of movement, mm -hmm. and I would say that there are a handful. Mm -hmm. And from there, he... Um, we were trained, our bodies were trained. So I try to stick with the principles and as Laura said not to make it precious but to to impart the principles and if other people dancers are you know wish to develop the, the principles mm -hmm. then they take on the legacy too um, in terms of teaching the dances themselves um, they I think that they stay pretty true to what Eric was, was um, you know, what he put out on the stage. And as today, when, when um, Laura taught the Plains Daybreak class, that there was an improvisatory section. And as, you know, this, the students stayed with the, um, the principal. And then, you know, they breathed life into the work themselves as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing that is. Uh, particularly, um, I think interesting is that 
So we're talking about a, a generation of students that you may be working with who were born 10 years or you know six, seven years after um, uh, Eric passed away. So is a sense of historical performance perhaps in their you know awareness or lack of awareness about his work. But as you mentioned, he was um, very um, focused on newness, right? And being vibrant and in the moment and thinking about these philosophical underpinnings of the connections between art and, and working with contemporary composers, right? So yeah. that must be an interesting thing to uh, juxtapose. I mean, I see corollaries in music as well, of course, in the other performing arts, but it's particularly interesting. So how has that work, that ongoing work, um, informed, you know, the things that you do today. I mean, you mentioned briefly, there are some examples, I think, of mentioning your work as a curator at 92nd Street Y. Um, obviously, I would imagine that there are, you know, being a curator, and you mentioned uh, working with legacy work, that, that that's part of your role, in a way, is identifying these connections and, and, and threading the needle. Is that fair to say? And, and how, how do you, I mean, thinking back, I guess, in a way, um, to your time with Eric Hawkins and just in general your career, how has that prepared you to be a curator effectively at a place like the 92nd Street Y? Um, one of, one thing I learned from Eric was to stay alive in my senses and, mm. or our senses, and to approach work with an open heart. So as a curator, I really try to stay open to what I'm seeing and try to understand point of view of the choreographer. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps because I, I danced with Eric and he danced with Martha Graham and he danced with Balanchine and mm -hmm. he studied with Kreutzberg, I really do have a sense of legacy mm -hmm. and the importance of legacy. And so um, I see my role as preserving all legacy, <laughs> all dance legacy, as much dance legacy as I'm, as I'm able. Um, it's important, of course. You know, we have to know our history, and and I think that Eric's is it is a very important history and overlooked. Mm -hmm. So um, that is one of our goals to to expose people to his um, you know very very deeply deeply developed aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Complete aesthetic. When I, when I think about your curation, it's very holistic. So, <laughs> not only does she have performances of dance, but she'll bring in an author who wrote about it, and a musician, and a costume maker, and she'll have panels of all these people that participated in the creation and production of these works of art. And to but me, always live performance too. Mm -hmm. Yes, That's yes, great. bringing back the performance. Yes. So, but that to me comes directly from. Eric's understanding yes. that it's all a whole, mm -hmm. that it's not enough to just look at the dance. Um, or a tape of the dance. Or a tape of the dance, but that it's all these arts put together and all these different thoughts put together. Mm -hmm. And I think that shows up in your curation. Mm -hmm. I also choreograph, and so mm -hmm. what I what I do really, I think, really is in his lineage. Mm. Um, at least the at least the principles, I really try, I, 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 they are a foundation mm -hmm. on true. which to rely <laughs> and build. It's important. Well, you're pointing to the power of mentorship and um, the impact, I mean, this cuts across the performing arts, these stories of how having a formative experience working with an artist or a mentor of any kind, actually, can have profound effects on your own expression and your professional trajectory. Um, so can we talk about that for a moment, just in terms of mentorship? I mean, so you're also historians and you're working on a biography now, right? And okay, I, you studied art history, you studied composition. So what is it like to be a historian? <laughs> I mean, wh what are the skills? Of dance. Yeah, yes, I mean, yes. I mean, I certainly there's, you have expertise, no doubt. But I'm, what are the growing pains in, in working in that arena? Yeah. Um, it's a steep learning curve. I mean, is. right now, the biggest thing is organization. How the heck do you keep all the information yeah. that you're finding in some kind of logical place so that five years down the road, when you're putting the final touches on, you've actually remembered all the mm -hmm. stuff. But um, I mean, we're lucky that there is a huge wealth of, of um, information in the Library of Congress, of Eric's letters, between um, the composers and artists that he worked with, mm -hmm. because they all didn't live in New York City. So there's these 
great conversations. He kept carbons of all of the letters that he sent. Wow. So we have the whole conversation of, he worked with Alan Hovannis, was one of the composers yeah. that he worked with. And he sends this, you know, 17-page scenario to Hovannis. And then they converse back and forth. And then Eric asks for revisions of, mm. you know, very detailed re measures, 38 to to 45, I need blah, blah, blah. I mean, so th this is an incredible conversation. <laughs> and so as historians, finding these details, you know, we, we danced with him and knew him intimately mm. in one way, but now reading his diaries and his letters, it's wow. just really fleshing out the whole fellow, so. I mean, did you feel, what are the what are the areas of, gr of like growing pains, if you will, in taking on a project like that? considering your respective backgrounds and your professional activities, what were the hardest, what is the hardest part of, of taking on that project? On what to concentrate. <laughs> I mean, it really, it, you can take most of this material and develop it in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what we're working toward right now is mm -hmm. to find um, coherence in the um, timeline, but also, you know, what, what parts of this timeline mm -hmm. will expand and uh, yeah, what moves forward? Yeah, yeah, it's a big it's a big learning curve. Um, <laughs> we've so we've done we do presentations at conferences. So we you know we take little bites of things. Yeah. So we'll write a proposal to do, you know, how he worked with this one sculpt, mm -hmm. and and find a lot of the the archival material about that and mm -hmm. photographs and. And then, you know, we wrote an article for a, a volume of current dance research that was looking at um, an extended version of that mm -hmm. um, collaboration. And so we take little bites of things mm -hmm. to write, write them up. And we're like in college again. We'll be up at yes. three, in, three in the morning. You know, there's a deadline. We're on Google Docs, mm -hmm. both of us typing at the same so time. Different, different locations. <laughs> different <laughs> locations, yes. right. So... Um, but it's it's fun, you know. It's we're passionate about the subject matter, and we have some good mentors also that we've spoken with in dance conferences that are really excited about the project. So we can send stuff to them and get ideas. Yes, I so. mean we we've been interviewing mm -hmm. uh, many collaborators, dancers, mm -hmm. etc., and that's also been well both a challenge, fascinating, and a challenge because people's memories fade and sure it's finding the ways of you know pulling reminding people mm -hmm. of what it, of what it was like to work with Eric decades ago right and I'd imagine that the stories you you hear they're varied right depending on the individual and what they remember about that moment and all the other circumstances and can add another sort of dimension um, to the actual records right so um, but I mentioned challenges too well, I wish we could talk all day, frankly, but um, I want to, um, just before we run out of time, a lot of our audience is students um, and some alumni as well, uh, many of whom might not imagine uh, this kind of a trajectory, right? And I would imagine that you probably couldn't have predicted all the, the things that have happened in your professional careers. So just in closing, what... If you were, if we were talking directly to some students today, and they were asking you about, well, how did, how do I develop? You know, I'm interested in all these things. I don't know how to develop. Where do I start in developing skills? Or, you know, I don't know what the next steps are. Um, do you have any thoughts or advice for students today, since you work with them, um, uh, in terms of what they might be thinking about, in terms of cultivating skills, being open-minded to opportunity? Just what you know, some general advice for next steps after graduation. Um, well, I think that you, you hit the nail on the head is to be open and available and take every opportunity possible. In terms of practicalities, um, I'm familiar with New York City and, but I would, I would say that this is anywhere. One, um, you get yourself out there mm -hmm. as much as possible. It's all about showing up. Mm -hmm. And, and as we've spoken about, yeah. uh, staying in touch with your colleagues and mm -hmm. your professors and developing more relationships mm -hmm. because jobs are often, um, procured isn't the right word, but you get a job through friends. Mm -hmm. 
So. And opportunities develop based on the, you talked about mentors, but relationships and trust over time that are unpredictable. So yeah. mm-hmm. um, that, that makes mm-hmm. sense. Great advice. Laura, what would you say? Um, for me, I, I'm actually quite shy. Mm-hmm. And so the idea of putting myself out there was not a comfortable place mm-hmm. to live. So more, I just, I showed up. You know, I saw everything I could see. I went to dance performances and music performances and, um, you know, learned how to sneak in different ways because I couldn't afford to go to everything. So I figured out how you can get into shows to see them, to make sure I could see everything and then show up to class and show up to class and show up to class. And then, but it's also community. I choreographed with some friends from college Mm. that had also moved to the city and we would, you know, get on showcases and stuff to show our choreography so for me, I, I, I was not of the nature to, um, you know, go out and meet lots of new people mm-hmm. and, and um, pump myself up for that kind of thing. Um, so I was fortunate that things worked out for me. Mm-hmm. But so I guess my only point in saying that is there's many ways, many avenues, and it's not always that you have to go, go, go. It's sometimes you gather in. So I gathered mm-hmm. in people that I knew and had affinities for to do performances. That's great advice. I mean, this idea of knowing yourself rather than following a prescriptive, you know, 10 steps to success. You've talked a lot about how knowing yourself and simultaneously know, uh, uh, starting there, but then also pushing yourself in different ways led to this opportunity, this platform early, earlier on in your careers that has been so instrumental in carving out other opportunities later, which I think is great advice. I also love the, the story. This is embedded in the stories you told about the transferability of skills you know, um, so you didn't let the fact that you studied art history or was a, or were a composer inhibit the right opportunity when it came forward. So there's got to be uh, a, a sort of a sense, a compass, if you will. I think a compass is a good way to describe it for what seems like a good thing for you. Um, and, and I think uh, um, that that come those opportunities come forward more often when we're also reflective about those those activities. And that's harder and harder to do today. So. Well, I thank you so much for coming and sharing some time with Thanks us and talking about your experience, your careers. We really look forward to following your work and the biography as well. Thank, thank you, you very Jonathan. much. Thank you.